Talk about food right after everybody just got done eating lunch. That's always, that's always a tough one. It's kind of like talking about ice to Eskimos. Or like going, going grocery shopping when, you, when you're hungry. It's just not quite as much fun. But I'll, I'll try and make this good for you guys, even though I know nobody's probably hungry anymore after that awesome meal. Um, I'm going to be talking to you tonight about sports nutrition. One of, one of the things that, that I do is I'm a sports nutritionist. And I help people to fuel their body with the calories that are necessary to stay in shape and exercise and work out and even do some of the crazy things that Tree was talking about, but to do so without destroying the body, to kind of defy the modern paradigm of Frankenfuels and, you know, give a big finger to Gatorade and figure out different ways to, to fuel our bodies. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Also, I'm a huge fan of interaction and of really responding to and answering the questions that, that you guys have about your own workouts, pre-post-workout nutrition, how to fuel your body for the specific things that you're doing, whether it's a 5K or weightlifting or CrossFit or long walks or whatever. So I will leave plenty of time also for some Q&A so that I can find out what it is that you want to know about because I always find that that opens up some really interesting discussions when we get some, some questions as well. So, a little bit about me, even though Tree already kind of introduced me a bit. My, I actually, I was a college tennis player, but shortly after that, I got into bodybuilding and posing on stage in the equivalent of, of my mom's underwear. So, this is, this is what I used to do. Actually, in that photo, it doesn't even look like I'm wearing anything. Um, and, you know, I, I made a pretty, a pretty stark and, and contrasted movement from that into endurance sports. For about eight years, I got into Ironman triathlon. And I, I actually wound up taking a lot of my studies. I, I got a master's degree in physiology, biomechanics, and human nutrition, and began to apply a lot of what I was learning kind of in the trenches to, to people who were out there doing these things, whether they wanted to, to lose a few pounds or do something like an Ironman triathlon. So I pretty much lived my life for the past decade going out, figuring these things out, making lots of mistakes. Yes, I've thrown up. I have crapped my pants. I have gotten <laughs> horrible immune issues. I've done everything to my body while I've been out there exercising just to kind of find out what works and what doesn't. And one of the things that I also spend a lot of my time doing is I work for a company called Wellness FX, where I look at the blood work and the biomarkers of a lot of athletes. They send me their triathletes and their marathoners and their crossfitters and their exercise enthusiasts to see what's going on in the human body when you, when you feed it certain nutrients or when you, when you don't feed it certain nutrients. And so do a lot of time in the trenches. And now what I've gotten into, as Tree was saying, is Spartan racing. So kind of burnt off of triathlon for a little while. And if I'm walking around up here a little bit like I have a stick up my butt, it's because I just did the, the Spartan race up in Killington, Vermont. And it, it kind of destroyed me. And I'm, I've got wounds all over my knees. And uh, I, I'm not infectious, I promise. You're OK. But, but this is what I do. I jump over um, teeny tiny fires that they try to make look really big on TV and in photos. So, um, so I also have a family at home. And you know, like, like Tree was saying also, and I promise I won't open up every slide by saying like as Tree was saying. But uh, you know, one of the cool things is that we live in this amazing era where we have the ability to optimize the children in our life, to look, feel, and perform like amazing human beings. And even more importantly than that, to grow up to make this world a better place. And a big part of that starts with food, too. So we're very focused on food in our home. And we feed our, our kids, and I, I won't talk too much about children's nutrition today, but a wide variety of ancestral foods. You know, they grow, they've grown up on bone broth and sardines and grass-fed butter and natto and, you know, weekly big loaves of sourdough bread and, you know, all, all the things that I'll kind of talk about how you can incorporate into your athletic lifestyle as well today. And my wife... Uh, my wife and I actually run something called the Inner Circle, where, where people go online and, and they watch videos of her teaching cooking concepts and healthy living concepts and how to make your own household cleaning chemicals and armpit deodorants and all this funky stuff. And uh, so that's, that's what we do at home. That's, that's what the home life is like. And I also, of course, have to do the shameless promotion that I have a book over there. It's called Beyond Training, and it's about everything other than the workout part that you can do to make your body better and to recover and, and to, to train the right way. So it's called Mastering Endurance Health and Life. And don't worry, it's not just for people 
who jump over fires. <laughs> okay, so how many in here actually um, run, bike, swim, lift, exercise, try and do something to keep your bodies in shape? Okay, cool. Some of the photos that, that I show here may look a little bit familiar to you. For example, who's been to like a marathon pre-dinner or a pasta party or like, a, like an Ironman Expo or something like that? This is what it looks like. It's like a cattle feed. Just hundreds of people lined up to eat pasta and donuts and soda and Gatorade. And it, you, you would be surprised, but you know, the, the, the prevailing research put out by the Gatorade Sports Science Institute right now is that you need the equivalent of about seven to nine huge bowls of pasta the day before you do something like a marathon. Like that's how much carbohydrate you need, that's how much sugar you need. And so what they do at these events, if you ever sign up for one or go to one, or for those of you who've been to one, you know this, they just line you up and just stuff you full of crap that Nora just got done telling you about. It's so bad for you. Or, you know, for example, I, I know that a lot of people around here in Vermont ride bicycles. And, and this is, you know, for a long time, I used to ride my bicycle. Electrical tape with gels, lots and lots of sugary maltodextrin and fructose-based gels taped to the top tube, okay? And this is not much different than what you see in like the juice bar or the smoothie bar or the front desk of a lot of health clubs and gyms that you go to. Same concept except, you know, a lot of times when you're on a bicycle and you're competing, you're taking this stuff out on the road with you. And believe me, I, I have found every way possible of squeezing. I, I used to like have little water bottles I'd hide under here with extra fuel and I had one behind the seat. I might show you some more pictures later on. And like when I'm riding, I would stuff, like when I did Ironman Hawaii for the first few years, literally all around this short pocket and all around the other short pocket, just full of sugar, all just chock full of gels, as many as I could squeeze in there. And we also have our big man in a can tubs, right? The, the prevailing recommendation that, that you finish a workout, and as soon as you finish that workout, even if you're still burping up your, your pre-workout meal, you know, your pre-workout, whatever, your steel cut oats or your special fancy engineered protein powder, you get out and you find that shaker bottle or you go to the smoothie bar at the gym and you get your post-workout fuel, right? Your, your optimized, well, what they say now is, is a four to one ratio of carbohydrates to protein for optimized uh, replenishment of, of fuel. What they don't tell you is that all that research is done in folks who have been fasting for 8 to 12 hours. Every week a giant canister of these cans would show up at my front door and I had no clue what was in them. They were just, it was, I was, it was just after college, it was free food. And I would drink these things and I, I wouldn't be able to poop for two days, but it, I mean it was like, it was food. And I would just drink these, thinking that they were just like the best engineered fuel on the face of the planet. And, uh, you know, that, so I've done this too. Um, you know, filled as many of my pockets as possible with gels to go out on a run because that's what research, that's what the magazines, that's what the nutrition articles were saying was you got to keep your body fueled during exercise. You got to keep sugar coming in. You're going to bonk if you don't keep those, you know, carbohydrate levels topped off. And, you know, this is, this is all stuff that is the prevailing um, message right now in sports nutrition. This is how athletes are out there fueling themselves. Uh, let's use an example of Ensure Plus. Doc, doctors approved, right? Um, there, so like, I'll, I'll be racing, I, see I avoided saying like Tree mentioned. Um, I'll be racing Ironman in uh, two weeks. And one of the, or, or a few of the, the top Ironman champions, there's two things you'll see them out there on the course with or preaching about in, in their books and the, and the interviews leading up to the race when people say, what do you eat before an Ironman? You get a Red Bull, is one of the things that they'll, that they'll toss back out there on the course. You know, as much taurine and caffeine and sugar as you can get into your body just dumped in there like rocket fuel. Uh, same stuff that's been banned in Europe when mixed with alcohol, but they're out there on, on the course slamming it back. And then uh, the other thing that you hear a lot about is, is uh, most, most of them are Australian, really. Most of the best endurance athletes are Australian, so they drink in sure full of rice. <laughs> drink Ensure. I have two big cans of Ensure, mate. It's doctor's approved. And uh, so, the, so they'll have this Ensure, so I figured we could look at the approved by doctors ingredients for Ensure, and this is what Ensure looks like. So I don't know, let's just look at this. So we've got milk protein concentrate, and I really doubt that's from like a, like a hormone-free A2 fed cow. You know, they grew up. You can do well on Ensure on gel, like this is what the champions, this is what the best of the best are using, okay? 
Now go read the interviews, listen to the, to the podcast, watch the videos of the guys who are now 40 and 50 and 60, the women who are done with their careers. Go look at their faces. It looks like a freaking elephant trunk. Okay, there is so much connective tissue damage and, and reactive oxygen species and advanced glycation end products breaking down connective tissue. Look at how many knee replacements there are, hip replacements, joint replacements. Um, you know, no matter how good the, the race resume is, a lot of these folks, they're, they, you can tell they've got like leptin resistance, insulin resistance because they've ballooned up as soon as they quit exercising. All of a sudden, they're so hormonally dysregulated from all this crap that they've been putting into their body combined with, with not the best type of training, to create a scenario where you can be good, you can be a really good exerciser and have a great body and be super duper healthy on the outside and look really good in spandex. And still, you know, when, when you get old, and you want to be there to see your grandkids hit a home run. You want to be able to walk without pain, he said ironically as he limped around the stage, but I mean like long term, you know, you don't want like, like long term chronic joint degradation from the wrong type of fuels, from inadequate omega-3 fatty acid intake, from, from not getting anti-inflammatory components in your diet. So when you look at, at what a lot of these folks are saying, they're like, yeah, but I'm fast. I'm like, yeah, but you know, health and longevity is a big part of this too. And what I say is if you can get equivalent levels of performance while putting the right fuels into your body and staying healthy, then why not do it? And if, I mean, if your paycheck is on the line and if the healthy stuff makes you slower, I mean, that, that's, you know, that, that's your call. I don't, you know, I'm not speaking to a room full of professional athletes, right? I'm speaking to, to people who basically want to perform well but also fuel their body with good, nourishing, ancestral, nutrient-rich foods as they're out there exercising. And so that's what you got to look at this through, right? The lens of health versus performance. And you have to have that right balance between health versus performance. You got to be healthy on the outside and healthy on the inside. And that's what we're going for here. So some of the things, you know, you saw the insure label, but let's, let's look at this stuff. So FODMAPs, that's a big issue. A, a lot of the, the things that are out there, um, Gatorade, Powerade, uh, goos and gels, uh, a lot of bars, they're based on uh, typically like a fructose-based sweetener. And they also have some, some different types of carbohydrates in them that are fermentable. Okay, so people are out there running. How many of you out there have gone for a run and maybe you've used one of these fuels and you've gotten bloating or gas or you're kind of gummed up after or, or you, you don't have to raise your hand. I know this is embarrassing. Okay, so, but basically a big, big part of this can be these FODMAPs. So FODMAP stands for uh, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols, I think. Dietitians, did I get that? Okay, good, okay. Um, so FODMAPs, that's one of the issues, is we've got all these fermentable carbohydrates that give you gas and bloating while you're out there. Another one is autoimmune triggers. You know, we saw things like soy. We look at a lot of these bars and they have wheat. I don't have to, after Nora's excellent talk, explain to you some of the issues with gluten and a lot of these autoimmune triggers that are in these things that we're putting into our bodies, from Power Bar, uh, Cliff Bar is another one that has a lot of soy in it, a lot of wheats. Um, a lot of oats that tend to have a lot of gluten in them. So basically, autoimmune triggers that tend to disrupt thyroid function and disrupt hormonal function and cause a lot of net full body inflammation. Chemical preservatives, okay? So we can get a lot of potential carcinogens into the body with a lot of these things. Uh, artificial sweeteners. And the big issue with artificial sweeteners for, for the athletic population is not necessarily that artificial sweeteners have been shown to cause you to eat more later on, right? So whether you dump even stevia has some potential to do this, but whether it's stevia or acetylfan potassium or sucralose or whatever, you have a bunch of that throughout the day and it stimulates those incretin hormones. You start to produce all these gut hormones. Your stomach is telling your brain a message that there are calories present. I just tasted something sweet. Why aren't you giving me calories, dang it? And then you're hungry you know, one or two hours later on and when you finally do eat, you eat more than you should. For exercising individuals, that issue with artificial sweeteners is not so much the issue as the fact that it can really do some damage to your gut. Um, Jeff Leach, who I, who I just met, I don't know if he's in here, but he's gonna be talking about the, the microbiome tomorrow and like, and like the gut. And there's some really interesting studies and, and they aren't the best of studies. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're in rats and all that jazz, but basically they show that there might be some damage done to the gut by artificial sweeteners, specifically uh, killing of the good bacteria or creation of, of a dysbiotic intestinal environment when you, when you consume some of these artificial sweeteners. 
reactive oxygen species and appropriately named the, the ages that Nora also talked about the advanced glycation end products. So what we have here is that a lot of these sweet sugar-based compounds, a lot of this glucose that's getting constantly dumped into the body, it can react with proteins and react with fats within the body to create glycation, to create free radicals. And the argument that you hear a lot of nutritionists making is that, well, it's okay to eat sugar during exercise because it gets burnt as a fuel, right? So you don't get a big insulin release, you don't create this huge blood sugar spike because you're just using it as fuel. Well, if you're burning pure sugar as a fuel, you're still creating a lot of this inflammation, a lot of this free radical formation, regardless of what's going on with insulin, right? So part of this is not just sugar causing you to gain weight or carbohydrate consumption during exercise to cause you to gain weight. It's that it can cause some issues with everything from you know, neurofibrillary tangles from all the glycation that's building up to glucose oxidizing the fats and cholesterols that are circulating in your bloodstream to a lot of other issues that go above and beyond just insulin, which is what all the, you know, all the, the sports nutritionists want to focus on is does it or does it not cause an insulin spike? And that's kind of a moot point during exercise. You're pretty insulin sensitive during exercise. You should be more concerned about whether carbohydrates are going to cause inflammation or oxidation. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So let's, let's jump into uh, basically the fact that there's some change going on. This article appeared in a newspaper in Boulder, which is like the mecca of Iron Man training. You can't swing a dead cat by the tail without hitting an Olympian somewhere in Boulder. This is in the Boulder newspaper. Uh, the, and just in case you can't read this, uh, it's, Boulder athletes' resolutions include throwing out sports drinks and energy bars. And this was interviews with a bunch of pro athletes there that are starting to see the light, right? They, and, and this is a quote from one of the guys in that article. He says, you don't just put crap fuel into a high-performance vehicle. Just because a race car is burning through all that fuel doesn't mean you don't put high-quality fuel in it. Some people have the philosophy that they're training so hard and with so much intensity that it doesn't matter. Okay, and he just, he just put into really good kind of layman's term, what I, terms what I just outlined. Like, it doesn't matter if you're just putting any old sugar or any old carbohydrate-based fuel into the body because you're just exercising too fast. It has to be a high-quality-based fuel. And today I'm going to show you in really practical ways what some of those high-quality fuels are and some of, the, some of the choices that you make. But, you know, you got to think about your body as a race car, as a, as a Ferrari or a... You know, I don't know, what are they, what's the big fancy car out here, like a Hummer with Gatling guns or <laughs> but the uh, pickup truck? I, back in Washington State, it's pickup trucks. Like, people would laugh at this. They'd say, oh, I have a pickup truck with a gun rack. That's, that's, what, that's what we drive back there. You don't see Ferraris. You're a wuss if you drive a Ferrari. Uh, but basically, you've got to treat your body like a race car. Now, of course, this is, this is the thing. I, like... My triathlon team, I, I race for Team Timex. We train down in Bradenton, Florida at the IMG Sports Academy. And that's where the Gatorade Sports Science Institute is. Okay, so I've been, in, I've been in their big fancy lab. I've walked around. I've seen all these guys. They don't wear those suits like that. <laughs> that's a little bit of an exaggeration. There's, there's no nuclear reactor, don't worry, in the, in the Gatorade Sports Science facility. But basically, you know, these are big fancy labs testing out all these fuels on athletes running on treadmills and bicycling. Like, shouldn't this stuff actually be exactly what we need to support exercise? I mean, you would think that based off of all the money that goes into this, because when all these kids were walking around schools, you know, sitting in class, drinking their Gatorade or their Powerade or whatever so that they can keep their electrolyte levels topped off during math class, uh, you... <laughs> You, you would think that all this money that, that companies like this are getting are being put towards the best research possible. There are some issues, though. Okay, this is me lying on a table at University of Connecticut. Uh, I had just, in that photo, I'd run on a treadmill for three hours, and they are uh, taking about 250 milligrams worth of muscle tissue with a giant needle out of my right thigh. They also did it out of my left thigh, both butt cheeks. And the, other, the lady on the other side just, I don't know why you'd want to do these two things both at the same time, but they took blood while they were taking muscle from the other side. So I was just laying there in like a, like a dazed stupor. Uh, the reason I subjected myself to all that is because I followed for 12 months for, for that particular study a high-fat diet. In this case, I was actually eating about 80 to 90% fat, so it was a really high-fat diet. 
I don't necessarily endorse that much. I think 50 to 60% is a little bit more ancestral. But if you really want to biohack, you know, and just go into like full fat adaptation, this is called the ketogenic diet, right? Like 80 to 90% fat. So I followed this, this diet for 12 months. And then they brought me and some other guys who had followed this diet, which was a super duper hard diet to follow if you ever walk into an Italian restaurant, ever. <laughs> But I did it for 12 months, and uh, they compared me and a group of other guys who did it with a group of athletes who followed a traditional, kind of like traditionally recommended, you know, USDA food pyramid, 50 to 60 percent carbohydrate-based diet. They put us on a treadmill, both groups, not all at the same time on the treadmill, but one at a time on the treadmill, and they had us run for three hours. And what they did was indirect calorimetry, where you wear this gas mask that measures the amount of carbon dioxide you produce, the amount of oxygen you consume, and it tells you how much fat and how much carbohydrate you are burning as a fuel. Now, the prevailing research coming out of the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, and I keep saying that because they are like the creme de la creme, like they are the, the ones, ironically, because it's a nutrition company, that people go to for the, the most cutting edge research on nutrition. But all the other nutrition journals that you'll read in exercise, they say all the same thing. The human body can oxidize 1.0 grams of fat per minute, period. Okay, every single fuel that's out there Every single gel, sports drink, sports bar, anything out there is based off of that concept. The human body can oxidize 1.0 grams of fat per minute as a fuel. Well, guess what happened when they took all of us athletes who'd been following a high-fat diet, who'd been eating bone broth and, and butter and bone marrow and some of the other things we're going to talk about during exercise, like coconut oil and MCT oil and all that stuff. What, what happened when they took us and they put us on that treadmill for three hours? We were averaging 1.5 to 1.7 grams of fat per minute. We were tapping, and we didn't, we, they didn't give us anything to eat during this test, right? So we were tapping into our own adipose tissue, right? Very ancestral. We were using the fuel that we were born with and that we put onto our own bodies. We were taking the, you know, the fuel from our butt cheeks and turning it into energy in our liver and turning that into ATP. And we were doing that while running on a treadmill and completely rewriting the textbooks on how much fat the body can actually burn as a fuel. Okay, so I, I could talk about this study forever because there were so many other things we measured, uh, you know, like the, we, we did uh, uh, gut biome testing, we did cheek swabs for genetic adaptations, we did a ton of stuff, lots of blood work. But the takeaway message here is that, yeah, the stuff is engineered, but it's not engineered for people who are living ancestrally. It's engineered for people who are eating a typical USDA-based, carb-based diet who only know how to burn sugar as an energy, so you gotta give them sugar. Because if you give them fat, they can't burn fat for energy. So if you're in a fat-adapted state, if you're eating all this super-duper healthy food, you know the, what was it, beef, what did you say it was, beef stomach? Is that what we had out there? Oh, Pork, yeah, I was close. <laughs> The, the pork belly and all that stuff we have, like, if you're eating that stuff, then, like, you're putting your body into a state where it knows how to burn stuff other than sugar as a fuel. So number two, the, the next thing you don't take into account is that, and, and Nora kind of hit on this a little bit during her talk, is, I mean, you know, it's a big company. A lot of these, a lot of these companies that are, that are churning out these type of bars and drinks and fuels, we're seeing more and more, like, small mom and pop companies showing up now that are producing, like, bars with really nice raw, you know, like, raw cashews with chia seeds and maybe a little bit of, of honey and some dates. And, and, but, you know, ultimately, things that are more expensive, you know, the bars that you raise your eyebrow at at the little, you know, homemade grocery store because they're like $12 a bar compared to the $2 power bars. But ultimately, it's ingredient costs, right? It costs a lot more money to put all, like, the raw almonds and the pumpkin seeds and everything else into fuel versus just pure sugar. Okay, part of that is, is government subsidy of grain and corn, and part of it is, is what it takes to get all those ingredients mashed together. But basically what it comes down to is ingredient cost is also not taken into account. What we see in the grocery stores and the sporting goods stores and on websites and recommended in magazines, and a big part is recommended because that's what we like to taste. The hum most, most humans, when given the opportunity, we're going to choose a sugar cube over a pumpkin seed. It's just the way we're wired. There's a bigger dopamine release when you taste sugar. It's like nature's dessert when you rip that fruit off the tree and you bite into the big apple. Like, that actually, when you're exercising, that actually tastes pretty good compared to, like, a giant greasy leg of turkey, right? So it's, it's not like we can't retrain the human palate or learn ways to make stuff good without it just being pure, processed, simple sugars. But ultimately, another thing that we don't take into account is the reason we're surrounded by all this stuff is not just because it's engineered fuels, but because it's being sold to people who aren't fat adapted, 
it's the cheapest stuff to make. It's the stuff that they know people are going to buy because it's really, it's, it's really addictive to the human palate. You get a big dopamine release. And then the last thing is the other issue that we're going to have to hurdle today. <laughs> That's real food versus convenience. OK, if I'm going to eat like real ancestral foods, let's say, you know, throwing macronutrient ratios to the wind and assuming we were just going to like eat bananas, like it's a lot. Trust me, like it's hard to race an Iron Man on like fruit and bananas and even like, you know, sweet potatoes wrapped in aluminum foil bulging out of your jersey pocket. You know, I tell people, why are you going to buy it? Like, and this is what like triathlon bikes, for example, cost. Why are you going to buy a $10,000 aerodynamic bicycle and then say you're going to race ancestrally and fill your jersey pocket with all these non-aerodynamic like sweet potatoes? It just doesn't make sense. Like, there are, there are other ways that we have to do things too. But that's a big thing is people will have these, these nice pieces of equipment. They want to be light during their marathon. So they're going to carry a gel, right? Not like a bunch of big water-filled apples with all the fiber and stuff in them. So that's another kind of barrier that we have to hurdle to is there's the, there's the paradigm between real food versus actually having something that's convenient and aerodynamic and light and something you can drag up and down hills. So you know, there, there are some compromises that we do have to make, but ultimately that's another reason that the engineered fuels are so popular. Again, not because they're necessarily healthy, but because they could fit into that little you know, aluminum foil gel wrapper. So there... <laughs> I was thinking there may actually be a workaround to this. <laughs> I don't have one of those. I don't remember where I found that picture. That's pretty funny. All right, so this is how I used to fuel my body. And I was good. I was, I was fast. I could be that athlete who would like win races. This is actually, that's me winning a half Ironman right there. And, um, you know, I'd go through 30, 40 gels during a race. I'd be doing sports drinks the whole time. And I would be fast, but I'd feel like crap. You know, I cross the finish line, and it's like you're laying awake at night, and your legs are twitching, and your body's like, caffeine, caffeine, caffeine. You know, because everything has caffeine in it. And you got like this sugar high, and then this hypoglycemic drop, and your body's just wrecked for days, and your joints hurt because all you've been burning is sugar. And it's just, it's a nasty, nasty scenario, and a big price to pay from a longevity and a health and a happiness standpoint for going fast for those one hours or those four hours or you know, feeling good during that one workout and feeling like you recovered right. So that, you know, and, and this is the type of stuff that I used to eat. I did a lot of peanut butter, right? You hear a lot about peanut butter as being like the calorie dense fuel. And I personally lived off Jiffy peanut butter in college. And you know, that, like when I was a bodybuilder, I started to go a little bit more low fat, but um, you know, I, I, I would still do like peanut butter. Like when I was a bodybuilder, it was those ABB protein shakes, peanut butter, and then I did tuna fish cans. And what I did in the tuna fish was so that I, it was palatable, I put ketchup and relish in it because those didn't have a lot of fat in them. But then I got a little bit of fat from, from the peanut butter, from like the Jiffy. Um, did a lot of bread, uh, a lot of like a whole grain, whole wheat bread. That was another staple in my diet. Uh, peanut butter on the bread, all the better. Um, did a ton of baked goods, and this is a huge one you see among athletes, scones, biscotti, baked goods. I know that for those of you who are sitting in the audience right now, a little bit of this might be preaching to the choir because I, I don't think a lot of you are walking around with a donut, but this is, this, this is the type of thing that athletes are fueling themselves these days. This is the type of things you're going to have to talk to the children in your life about as they grow up and begin to, to get exposed to these type of fuels in high school sports, collegiate sports. Trail mixes get handed out a lot, and trail mixes are very popular among athletes, and most of them are a very, very small part, extremely roasted nuts, a lot of vegetable oil, a lot of M&Ms, a lot of raisins, a lot of sodium, but this is another very, very common fuel that you see marketed or used among athletes. This is another thing that, that I ate a lot of was trail mix. Uh, milk, did a lot of milk. Um, I used to go through a good gallon of 2% milk a day, just regular 2% milk from the grocery store every single day. And that, you know, because uh, chocolate milk right now, has anybody heard about the chocolate milk, like seen the news about chocolate milk? Like it's considered to be like the magic compound. And they say, well, it's kind of funny now because they take chocolate milk and they compare it to Gatorade and they say like, it, like the headlines say like, the new natural recovery drink for athletes? And it's like chocolate milk. We're talking about like Yoo-Hoo commercial chocolate milk with Hershey syrup. And it's like, this is the new natural alternative to Gatorade. And this, this is the type of thing that junior high and high school students and college students and, and athletes from around the world are getting encouraged to drink is just regular old chocolate milk. 
and then lots and lots of the typical energy bars from the grocery store. I'm going to show you guys some alternatives, the type of bars that are actually made with real food today that, are, that have a lot less of the FODMAPs, the autoimmune issues, the potential to form a lot of these reactive oxygen species and advanced glycation end products. But most of the stuff here, yeah, it's sold as engineered fuel, and it's easy to put into your jersey pocket as you're about to go on a bike ride, but it's not necessarily the best thing. Uh, but I, I did go through a lot of bars as well. So now what I do is I ask myself two simple questions. Now, first of all, it's important to understand that what we are talking about right now is fuel for training, okay? not fuel for competition. We're going to talk about competition in a second, what you can take out there with you if you're going to do a, a race, a Spartan or a marathon or a cycling race or something like that. But now I ask myself two simple questions. Okay, Question number one, is it nutrient dense? These are the only two questions I ask about the foods that I'm eating during the day. Is it nutrient dense? Okay, so for example, um, well, let, let me tell you the other question that I asked first. The second question that I ask is, is it digestible? Okay, is it nutrient dense? Is it digestible? Let's use like quinoa or amaranth or millet as an example, okay? Um, for the most part, in the way that restaurants are serving it and the way that it is consumed these days, that is a very nutrient-dense grain, right? Rich in amino acids. It's a freaking like superfood of the, of the Aztecs or whatever. Um, but digestible, in many cases, no. I mean, it's covered in saponins, which is it's a soap-like substance meant to irritate the digestive tract, so you go and poop that quinoa out somewhere so it can grow into a new quinoa plant. Like, that, like plants have these elaborate defense mechanisms, and unless you somehow deactivate those elaborate defense mechanisms, they, plants can be very nutrient dense, but in many cases, they're not digestible. So that's an example of something that wouldn't satisfy my two criteria, at least in most situations. I mean, I'll talk later about situations where, where it may. But, so that's, that's nutrient dense, but it's not digestible. Then we have things that are digestible, right? Like um, white rice, for example. I don't do a lot of white rice because even though it's really digestible, it's not that nutrient dense, right? It's pretty much empty calories. So that's an example of something that only satisfies, again, one of those criteria. So if you start to go down the list, you can find all sorts of things that might be nutrient dense and they're not digestible, or they're digestible but they're not nutrient dense. And that makes life really simple for me. If I can look at a food, I can be like, boom, nutrient dense, check. Digestible, check. I will eat it, feed it to me. I eat 6,000 calories a day, so I'm... I'm good. I'll eat, a, I'll, eat, I'll eat a lot of it. Y'all are unlucky that I was first in lunch line today. There would have been more, there would have been more food. <laughs> okay, so type of foods I eat now. I do a lot of bone broth, okay? Um, I both order bone broth from, um, and I'll, I'll put a bunch of resources for you guys, by the way. I don't know if you saw that first URL, uh, but bengreenfieldfitness.com slash shellburn. I took a bunch of notes for you. So if you go there, you can, you can access a lot of the resources for stuff that I talk about today. BenGreenfieldFitness.com slash Shellburn, as in S-H-E-L-B-U-R-N-E. And I'll put that URL back up at the end. Now I do a lot of bone broth. Okay, so we make, we make bone broth out of a whole chicken every week. Um, I actually eat the bones because those are really fantastic for cartilage and joint regeneration. So we leave the chicken in there long enough to where the bones get soft. I, I like cover the bones with sea salt and olive oil. I eat the bones and I also will drink the broth as well. So I have a big cup of bone broth at least every day. And interestingly, I talked about this in, in a podcast that I did with the guy who makes the bone broth that I now order and have shipped to my house frozen because I go through more bone broth than my wife wants to make. So she, she gets PO'd because she's running out of bone broth. So I order it from this guy. It's called the brother, and he ships his frozen bone broth around the U.S. Uh, but I'm considering using bone broth during Ironman Triathlon in Hawaii in a couple, just filling up water bottles with bone broth and just basically drinking bone broth during the race. I've, I've never done that before, and I will have to try it a couple times, but... I'm concerned. So I do a lot of bone broth. Do a lot of eggs. Are they nutrient dense? Heck yeah. Uh, are they digestible? For most people, I mean, unless you've had like the type of Cyrex testing that Nora was talking about, and you've got some autoimmune issues with, with eggs, you know, egg whites usually is the issue. Um, eggs, great staple to have in the diet. I don't eat a lot of them. I am not paleo, okay? I do not have a six egg omelet every morning. I'm not one of those people. But I, I eat like usually about the equivalent of around one to two eggs about every three or four days or so. So I don't eat a ton of eggs, but the eggs are a staple in my diet. Yes, I'm seeing hands go. What's that? Both. 
both. So if you, if you wash the shell, but like I'll, I'll drop it in a smoothie, sometimes even include the shell to get a little bit of extra calcium. Um, but you can do, I mean, I, I don't like the texture of uncooked eggs that much. So usually it's scrambled. Um, plus, like, that's the one meal that my kids and I love to make together is scrambled eggs. So um, I can make more than scrambled eggs. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a complete caveman. <laughs> uh, but eggs, yes, love the eggs. Um, seaweed, we do a lot of seaweed. I, I go through so much nori. Like, I, I literally have a salad almost every day, and I just use the little seaweed nori wraps. Get the kind that aren't flavored with all the crap, like the cayenne pepper and the canola oil and all that stuff, but just like regular old nori sheets. I use that like a burrito wrap, and I'll eat my salads every day just wrapped in nori. It's a great way to get seaweed in. I also do uh, marine phytoplankton. I'll get that in like little dropper. Uh, it's like a little liquid dropper of marine phytoplankton. And then I do chlorella and spirulina as well. If you're doing a lot of seafood, seaweed actually pairs very well with seafood in terms of seaweed derivatives having iodine, selenium, a lot of really good electrolytes, fatty acids, amino acids. They really help to counteract some of the metal toxicity that can be present in seafood as well. Like we were talking about this, I was talking about with you the other night, chlorella, David, and yeah, how chlorella can act as, as like a detox, as a, as a metal binder if you're eating, for example, fish that has metal in it. So I do a lot of seaweed derivatives. Um, so chlorella, spirulina, nori, phytoplankton, all that stuff. Um, do a lot of organ meats. Um, I actually will travel with uh, like, a, like a thyroid extract. I use one called Nature Gold. It's from like an A2 cattle in New Zealand. But when I'm at home, I don't use that supplement. I just use, I, I eat organ meats once a week for the fat soluble vitamins and for all the hormonal support. That's all the more important for athletes because I tend to see a lot of athletes have testosterone depletion, um, estrogen dominance, low, low DHEA, high cortisol, a lot of issues that reflect hormonal dysregulation. And organ meats are a really, really good way to turn that around. I mean, if I could choose anything that I'm talking about right now for athletes to include as a staple every week, it'd be bone broth and organ meats, the two things that I actually don't see athletes doing a lot of, unfortunately. And livers can be made really, really good. Like I basically soak mine in raw milk for half a day, I take it out, I dredge it in egg, I dredge that in coconut flour, I cook it in butter or ghee or bacon fat, sea salt, black pepper, some onions, boom, done. So yeah, there you go, Chef Boyardee. Um, <laughs> Raw nuts, raw seeds, raw nuts. I always go raw. I do three to four Brazil nuts every day. The main thing with nuts is that most of the stuff that's out there that's served to athletes and exercise enthusiasts these days is like the roasted version that's in trail mix. So I like order Brazil nuts in the shell, okay, and I keep them in the freezer so they don't get moldy, and I just take three or four out and I crack them with the, with the nut cracker at the beginning of the day and toss those back every day, and then usually like about the equivalent of a handful of raw almonds at some point later on in the day or, or in a smoothie or something like that. Now, nuts have a lot of omega-6 fatty acids. A lot of people overdo them because they're easy. So I like to think about it this way. Eat nuts the way that you would eat them if you had to like break them open, right? If you had to crack them out of the shell. Like that's how you should think about nuts. And if you gotta buy them in the shell so that you force yourself to do that, that might be a smart move. If you tend to be a person who overdoes the nuts, or even if you go out and get one of these blood tests, you can get these blood tests called omega-3 index tests that give you the the ratio of omega-6 fatty acids to omega-3 fatty acids in your body. And if you've got really, really high levels of omega-6 fatty acids, then you may want to actually back off on the nuts. That's the number one thing I tend to see athletes overdoing and people in general overdoing is like just too many nuts. Um, because we're nuts over nuts. Shellfish, uh, I had a lot of oysters this week at that farmhouse bar and grill in Burlington. Love those. Shellfish uh, is chock full of nutrients. It's another really, really good ancestral food to include as a staple in your diet. And I do a lot of that as well. You just need to be careful of, of the, uh, the source. And as far as fish goes, we do a lot of uh, Wild Planet or Bella brand sardines as well, just because we live inland in inland Washington state. So getting like fresh fish is a little bit more difficult, but we do uh, fish in the can. And then we eat boogers. <laughs> Natto, we actually eat now. Um, it's really easy to get like a natto starter from the local Asian market, and you can ferment that yourself and make your own natto with just one starter. A really, really rich source of vitamin K2, um, and you know it, it pairs well with a lot of like uh, you know like fermented and, and soaked grain dishes. It goes well with salads. You can wrap it in the nori. That's another one I like to do. Is the I'll take the, the natto and wrap it in the nori. 
just because I like to eat things that are hard to pronounce or that sound weird or that most of my friends don't know what I'm talking about. So natto is actually really, really good too. I, I raced in Japan for a while and just fell in I used to have every morning for breakfast in Japan and now I still get it. And now we, we just make it in a big old casserole dish. Really simple to make. Yeah, vitamin K2, yeah. And it's a, it's a fermented soy, so you get a lot less of the digestive enzyme issues with, with fermented soy products like miso or natto or you know, tempeh or any of those, those soy sources that are fermented. Yeah. If, honestly, it's not that bad. Like, if you disguise the flavor, um, <laughs> if you plug your nose, <laughs> um, no, it's not that bad. And actually, mustard, if you have like a good stone ground mustard, that goes really well with natto as well. So, there you go. Serve your friends seaweed wraps with mustard and natto the next time they're over. Um, I usually do just liver, and then I use a, a supplement called Thyro Gold when I'm traveling and I'm not eating organ meats. Um, we do sweetbreads every once in a while. I order head cheese. Um, I actually, well, my, my wife just butchered a pig, and up until that point we didn't, we were ordering our head cheese. Now we have a bunch that she made, but uh, U.S. Wellness Meats, I order head cheese from them, which is, uh, you know, that, that has a lot of organ meats in it as well. Um, so, yeah, mostly liver, though. We liver at least every week. It's mostly cow liver, yeah, yep, exactly. So, and then I do deer liver once a year when I, when I shoot my annual deer. Okay, and of course, I do lots of uh, very dark, deep, rich berries. Um, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to fructose necessarily when it's got a lot of fructose and anthocyanins and skins and stuff on it. Um, it's just that when you are sitting around sedentary, um, that's when I'm not a big fan of fructose or when it's in its isolated fructose form. But when it's packaged in nature's format as dark and colorful as possible, I do pomegranates, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, stuff like that. I generally save it for post-workout and um, that's when fructose is going to be least metabolically disruptive. So I really don't eat fruit unless it's after a workout. So that or in the morning when you wake up and your, your liver's glycogen stores are empty, that's another good time to eat fructose. Okay, and then fermented foods. Uh, we do a lot of fermented foods, and again, for, for athletes, for, uh, for the health of your gut, I don't have to rehash what most of you in here already know about fermented foods and their health. And then finally, lest I kick it to the curb completely, I eat quinoa. I do waffles and pancakes made with buckwheat. Um, we do fermented homemade sourdough bread from a local non-GMO Washington red wheat. Uh, we pretty much, anytime we do a grain, we soak it, usually in like a water vinegar medium. Um, typically it's anything from, from 12 to 48 hours, depending on the grain. We sprout grains a lot, we do sprouted quinoa. We basically render grains digestible if we're going to eat them. And then we made sure if it's something like wheat, that the gluten hasn't been concentrated by it having been bred for like high yield crop or something like that. So we do grains in moderation. Uh, we, we definitely aren't like a high carb family, but like my kids, most mornings before school, like they'll have some quinoa with some raw nut butter, uh, sometimes some blueberries in there, usually an egg on the side. So we definitely do grains, but we make sure that we've treated them properly just because they can kill you. I mean, it's the same, same way. I, I wouldn't jump out of a tree, right, to catch a deer and like sink my teeth into the backside of the deer's neck and try to wrestle it to the ground just because that wouldn't be digestible, right? It be, probably would be pretty nutrient dense. Be, that'd be a heck of a lot of fun. That'd be a new sport. I should, I should have Spartan introduce that obstacle, deer, deer wrestling. Um, but, you know, it's the same thing with quinoa. You don't just want to pick it up and eat it. You want to render it digestible. So it can be nutrient dense and non-digestible, or it can be nutrient dense and digestible, depending on how you treat it. And that's the way that it goes with most grains, including the, uh, oops, the, uh, the sourdough bread, you know. It helps it to, uh, to basically break down a little bit better in terms of the enzyme inhibitors and the saponins and stuff that are in quinoa. So most grains ferment pretty well in like a vinegar type of medium. So I also do uh, steel cut oats sometimes and I'll soak those for like 48 hours in apple cider vinegar and water and then cook them up. And they just, they, compared to when I eat steel cut oats by just pouring them out of the bag and like boiling them for 20 minutes, like if I soak them like that in vinegar, they're just like, they digest completely. I won a half marathon a couple weeks ago just doing steel cut oats beforehand. So, and, and that was exactly how I did them. Okay, so a typical day for me, you know, I'll wake up, I have a big old kale smoothie with some Brazil nuts, uh, 
you know, some coconut milk. I throw an avocado in there, some cinnamon, usually a little bit of apple cider vinegar, some lemon juice. Uh, typically between breakfast and lunch, I'll drink some kombucha uh, or some, sometimes some coconut water, sometimes just some sparkling water. I'll add essential oils to that, like lemon essential oil or peppermint essential oil. Um, I'll have what I call a big ass fatty salad for lunch, which is typically just like as many different vegetables as I can find out in the garden or from the grocery store with as many fats as I can possibly pour on top of them, like avocados and sardines and nuts and stuff like that. And then typically like before I work out or after I work out in the afternoon, I'll do some, some full fat coconut milk. Typically I put like a goat protein in there. I use, I use protein made by a company called Mount Capra up in Washington. It's a really, really digestible protein compared to cow protein throw some nuts in there, I do some dark chocolate, some red wine, uh, roasted vegetables, potatoes, fish. And that's typically uh, what, you know, what a typical day of eating looks like compared to the whole peanut butter bread scenario that, that I used to be in you know, before I got in, into supporting my athletic lifestyle with a more ancestral diet. And red wine is purposefully put before dinner. So I hack it so that I finish, I, do, I work out when my body is at its highest temperature and when testosterone and everything is gonna peak and usually that's in the afternoon. And then I follow that up by eating my most carbohydrate, sugar rich meal of the day, which is dark chocolate and red wine. And I actually have that before dinner, right after my workout, when it's gonna do the least metabolic damage. So there you go, dark chocolate, red wine before dinner. Who can argue with that? Okay, how am I doing for time? Perfect, good, okay. So, uh, if you want to stand up, walk around, lunge, stretch, let's just do that real quick before we jump into some stuff. So, everybody stand up. Okay, take your arms up above your head. Try not to knock your neighbor's glasses off. Everybody lean to one side. Lean to the other side. And again, lean to one side. Lean to the other side. Then drop your hands down and just shake it up. Just shake it up. Little Tai Chi move. Shake, 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 shake. March in place a little bit. Get the blood moving. Open up that spine. Twist from side to side a few times. A few neck circles. Big neck circles. Open up that blood flow to the head so you can understand all the really advanced scientific cutting edge stuff I'm talking about. And then finish by giving your neighbor a high five, as long as they look like they wash their hands. All right. Okay, now we're all awake again. And if you want, if you want to stay, yeah, no, that's a confusing one. You might turn and your neighbor is giving somebody else a high, I don't know. And I have no issues. I'm a big fan of like the whole sitting is the new smoking thing. So if you feel like standing while I'm talking or standing in the back or whatever, totally fine with that. Okay, now. Let's go into what we do when we aren't sitting at home with a big plate of natto and we don't have a big vat of bone broth and we want to go for a run or a bike ride or we want to go to the gym and we don't want to destroy our bodies with all these fuels because it's so easy to talk about a giant bowl of kale salad until you're trying to fit it on your bike handlebars and you know, ride your bike or you know, go to the gym with your giant you know, 16 ounce cup full of blueberries just because it's awkward. Okay plus other people's germs might get in there. So let's talk about three ways, three kind of real food-ish options for competing. I say real food-ish options, because like I mentioned earlier, there's a little bit of a compromise that has to be made, because it can be hard to put sweet potatoes in your jersey pocket and go for a bike ride. So option one is we mix easy to digest carbs with easy to digest proteins with easy to digest fats. I look for non-GMO based carbohydrate sources that are slowly released into the gut that are as close to nature as possible. Okay, um, one brand that I've used in the past is called You Can Super Starts. It's a non-GMO based, uh, like a, like a non-GMO corn based product that is released very, very slowly into the bloodstream. So you need to use about a quarter as much of it as you would from a normal carbohydrate source. And I have kept my body in what's called a ketogenic fat burning state, that same state that I used when I was showing you the picture of me getting the muscle biopsy and running on the treadmill. I used that carb all that year because I could take that type of carbohydrate during exercise and it would not pull me out of fat oxidation because I could use so little of it. Um, but the issue is that for some people, 
they have difficulty digesting that, and even that can cause gas and bloating, especially in people who are super duper FODMAP sensitive. So the other one that I've used in the past before is called Infinite, um, and that's like a potato-based uh, carbohydrate. It's like it's the same as you would get if you were to like take a potato and just like break it down into its smallest form. So that's still a relatively simple carbohydrate, but it doesn't have the crap in it that a lot of the, the other compounds out there do. It's got some stevia in there, and that's basically an example of an easy to digest carb. Okay, this would be something that you put in a water bottle or a flask, for example. I'll mix something like that up with an easy to digest fat. Okay, so there are certain forms of fats that are readily burnt by your cells as fuel. They're called triglycerides. Okay, they can be used to, to form ATP. When they're burnt as a fuel, they form ketones really well. And you'll find them in coconut oil or fractionated coconut oil. Coconut oil has been spun in a centrifuge to fractionate some of the medium chain triglycerides. That's called MCT oil. So I'll use coconut oil. Another thing that I'll use if I want an even more dense source is MCT oil. There are a bunch of different companies that make MCT oil. Um, this is the same stuff that you'd use in like, a, like this bulletproof coffee recipe that you see popping up now as MCT oils. But this is also another very easy to digest fat that compared to say like butter or lard or ghee or something like that, this actually is tolerated really, really well during exercise, okay? Um, another one is liquid ketones. Now this is not necessarily an ancestral food. But this, like, if, so if coconut oil is, so if, if MCT oil is really concentrated coconut oil, ketones are really concentrated MCT oil. They're not FDA approved. You gotta buy them from a lab or there's this supplement called Keto Force that they're in. But basically what they are is just pure liquid ketones. So you hear about ketosis and getting your body in ketosis. Well, you can actually, rather than making ketones yourself by burning fats as a fuel, you can just drink ketones. And they taste like freaking like liquid gasoline jet fuel. They're the nastiest things you've ever tasted. But they technically keep your body in this super duper high state of ketosis, the same as you would have been like, when we were all babies and we were breastfeeding and everything, that's the state that we were in was ketosis. And you can actually maximize, this is more of a biohack, but you can maximize those ketone levels while you're out exercising using something like that. Another one, I just did a Navy SEAL Hell Week uh, for civilians. It was down in Encinitas, California. It was eight days of sleep deprivation, physical and mental abuse, um, five to six hours of training a day, culminating with 56 consecutive hours of surf swim torture on the beach with 100 mile rucks and basically everything they could possibly do to break us down and make us cry, make grown men cry. And it was a, it was a cool experience because I, I made myself mentally and physically stronger, but it was also really, really scarring. And I, wo I literally woke up for a week afterwards in like night sweats and I could, I could hear like Coach Chris and Coach Mark and these guys just like shouting at me, you know, you suck Greenfield, go home Greenfield, you shouldn't be here Greenfield. Really, really tough week. But chia seeds got me through it. <laughs> so <laughs> every once in a while, they'd let us like run to our run to this tent where all of our stuff was scattered, our underwear, our boots, our mud everywhere. And I had these little water bottles. I literally brought down eight water bottles, and I just had them full of chia seeds. And like every once in a while, when I'd like run in there and dive in, I'd like grab a hose and like spray it in there and put the top on and leave it. And chia seeds, they like, they, they're really cool in water. They're like those little, what are they called, little pets that expand in water? Yeah, chia, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anyways, they release a lot of fatty acids and amino acids, and they actually work really well with, with a little bit of raw honey as well. It's a really, really nice natural sports drink. But I just drank those the whole time, and that kept me going all day long, just chia seeds. And, and when you mix them with water, they're really, really cool. You can also just put them in the refrigerator. They make like a little pudding. You can add stevia and lemon juice and stuff to them. But that's another easy to digest fat when you mix it in a water bottle. Okay, so with easy to digest carbohydrates and easy to digest fats, we then move into easy to digest proteins because again, you can't take a steak out on a marathon, but you can still put into your body the same amino acids that your body wants ancestrally to be there but can't access when you're out there doing something unnatural. So this is where you get things like amino acid powders or amino acid capsules that you can use during exercise as a replacement for sugar because they can keep your body fueled just as well as sugar but not give you all of that reactive oxygen species and advanced glycation end product buildup. 
Okay, so we can use these easy to digest proteins. Another example of easy to digest proteins is you can get like collagen or, or gelatin. Uh, and you can mix that in water. You can mix it with some of these carbohydrates in water bottles or some of these coconut oils or MCT oils in water bottles. That's another way to go if you wanted to get some of those proteins and amino acids during exercise. And like I mentioned, bone broth. Bone broth has both the easy to digest fats and the easy to digest proteins in it which is why I am, I'm not joking, I am seriously considering using that for my next Ironman, even though I haven't tested it yet. But that's an example of another easy to digest protein that you could use. So that's fueling option number one that gets us much, much closer to burning the type of fats and proteins that our bodies are meant to burn while minimizing sugar and carbohydrate intake while still being able to do some really cool feats of physical performance and exercise for long periods of time. Okay, easy to digest carbs, easy to digest proteins, easy to digest fats, everything that I just described to you, that I just showed you, you could very easily take that and you could mix it up in a water bottle. I did my Ironmans for the past two years with three of those things, with MCT oil, with the super starch, and with the amino acid powders. And what I do before my races is that I just put that in a blender, I hit blend, and I just dumped it all into water bottles. And what I use is my mix so that I got some, some electrolytes because it's really, really close to the electrolyte composition of human plasma is I use coconut water to, to mix it up with. So that works really well. There are other options though. Another option is fuel in the bottle, food in the pocket. Uh, there's a really good book out there called Real Food Portables. And even though a lot of the foods in that book are pretty carbohydrate based, you still got some issues with the glycation end bar products and the reactive oxygen species. It's a decent compromise. The book has things like little like rice cakes. So you get a bunch of like sushi rice. Again, not super duper nutrient dense, but if you're out exercising, remember we're not talking about the training day now. We're talking about what you've got in your back pocket when you're running down the side of a mountain. It teaches you how to make these like little rice cakes and you can cook them with some eggs and some bacon or put like some blueberries and some raw honey and some chia seeds in there. Shows you how you can wrap them in aluminum foil and basically put these in your pocket or put them on your bicycle for long rides. And it's a, it's a pretty good form of real food. And when you're using this concept of fuel in the bottle, food in the pocket, what that means is that you have to maintain a certain what's called osmolalic gradient in your stomach, in your gut when you're exercising. And if you're just eating real food, you're gonna get diarrhea, gas, bloating, and a lot of the nasty stuff that people tend to get, even when they're eating the good stuff while they're out there exercising, because you have to chase this stuff with salts and waters. So typically in a scenario like this, what you do is you'd have food in your pocket, okay, you'd have like sweet potatoes, you'd have rice cakes, you'd have maybe some of these bars that I'll show you that are, that are basically real food but in a bar format and aren't like a power bar or a cliff bar. And then you have a water bottle that has like either electrolytes in it, like there are effervescent electrolyte tablets or even like coconut water is a perfect situation for a case like this, like the unsweetened coconut water. So you have food in the pocket, fuel in the bottle. That's another scenario that works really well. I like this for, for cyclists especially, because for running it's a little bit harder to run with like rice cakes and stuff like that. But if you're cycling, and especially if it's not a race where you gotta stay super duper aerodynamic and you're gonna go out and ride like a century or do a cycling tour or something like this, this is a really good scenario. Um, here are some of the bars. If you weren't gonna make your own rice cakes, here are some of the bar brands that I found to be acceptable. And these are just some of the ones that, that I found over the past. I like the Hammer Bar. They use good ingredients. Most of these I choose because they're non-gluten, they're non-GMO, they have higher levels of fats in them, higher levels of protein, not quite as many carbs, no wheat, no soy, coconut base, a little bit more of a nutrient-dense sugar base. Usually if they're gonna use sugar, they'll use like raw honey or something like that. So I like the Hammer Bar, Coca Chia Bar. Lara Bar is not too bad, actually. Um, Quest Bar is okay. It's, it's at least gluten-free. I like that about it, but it has a few more preservatives in it than other bars. Um, I did not realize when I put this on my slide that it's an animated, oh, that's cool. See that? <laughs> mm. I'm, not doing it. I'm not doing anything and that's changing. Okay, but, but Noji bars, um, those are pretty good too as, as like a real food option. Um, Zing bars are not bad. These are just basically, you know, bar brands that you can look for at the grocery store in a pinch that are gonna be like the least damaging. Health Warrior makes a pretty good brand. Um, bonk breaker is not bad. Surprisingly, that's, that's actually what you find in the Ironman course now is, is bonk breakers. They're gluten-free and dairy-free, and they're an energy bar that's at least less damaging than a lot of these other bars that you find out there on the market, and it's a heck of a lot easier than making your own. Um, and then 
as far as, as the fuel in the bottle, there are a couple things that are similar to coconut water, low sugar, high in electrolytes that you could also put in a water bottle to go along. Scratch, low calorie, low sugar, mostly salts, and meant to drive the food that you eat into your small intestine. Okay, so this is a good choice. Um, there's another company called Osmo that's similar to Scratch, it does the same thing. So the reason that I'm, that I'm recommending these is like liquid fuels to go along with food is because basically that liquid fuel is driving the food and the liquid fuels that I'm talking about here, like the Osmo or the Scratch, they're low in sugar. So you're not dumping too many calories into your body, getting too much reactive oxygen species formation during exercise. So that's option number two. So option number one is we've got combination easy to digest carbs, easy to digest proteins, and easy to digest fats. Option number two is we use real food in our pockets, like any of these bars, which are pretty close to real food because of their composition, and then fuel in the, bo or, or, um, fuel in the bottle. Food in the pocket, fuel in the bottle. Then the last option, and this is actually what I did for the Spartan that I just raced, is fat-based energy gels. Believe it or not, not all the energy gels that you see out there at the grocery store are full of sugar. Many companies now are putting coconut butter and coconut oil and raw nut butters and fats and amino acids into their energy gels rather than the crappy sugar. So like if your kid has a soccer game and all the other kids have the, um, the I keep asking you guys these fuse I shouldn't know the answer to, the little straw that you put into the foil. Yeah, Capri Sun, yeah. Like all the other kids have that or the kids have like the, like the regular like power bar gels. You know, a lot of the things that you see kids at soccer games or basketball games and stuff eating during halftime. Like you can, you can, your kid can fit in, you know, you can give them one of these fat-based energy gels. Like so my kids will have like nut butter and stuff like that during their soccer games and they still, they're still getting the cool special foods, right, that they can unwrap. And I, I realize that that's not, it's not totally ancestral, but again, we're talking about um, aerodynamic, portable fuels that are not gonna do the damage to your body that this other stuff that I talked about does. Uh, and, and frankly, I mean, you can make your own raw nut butter at home. You could put it in a Ziploc bag and you could reproduce this, or you could pay an ungodly exorbitant amount of money to a company that conveniently does it for you and pay $5 for your tablespoon of almond butter. And frankly, a lot of people still will pay for that. So Artisana, raw almond butter, that, that's a good one. Um, Goo has one brand called peanut butter that's, that's lower in sugars, higher in fats, higher in amino acids. Um, there's a company called Agave and they use basically like a cacao butter. Okay, not like, not like chocolate syrup, but like a hard cacao butter in their fuel that is more fat based. There's another company called Huma. Huma makes an energy gel that rather than based off of sugar is based off of chia seeds. Okay, so that's another really good option. Um, Justin's is a great company. They make an almond butter. Uh, they've got one they put chocolate in, it's a little bit higher in sugar, but they also have just like a regular almond butter. Pocket Fuel, this is an interesting company because they sell nut butters, but they put like goji berries and raw seeds, raw nuts, so it's like a crunchy nut butter that again, you can put in your jersey pocket when you go for a run or you can take to the gym, and it's a source of fuel that isn't quite as disruptive metabolically. Um, v Fuel is, I believe V Fuel is another chia-based one. Pretty sure they're using V fuel in, in or Chi and V fuel. Vespa is interesting. They actually, so Vespa, no joke, they actually take an extract from a wasp, a Japanese wasp. They isolate the amino acids from the wasp, the same amino acids that that wasp uses to fly around all day long without getting tired, and they actually put it in a gel. And then they add like some, they add some bee pollen, some raw honey, and that's actually a really, really good way. It's only like 25 calories in one of the gel packets, so you wouldn't think that that's a lot of energy but it kind of helps your body tap into its own fatty acids as a fuel. So that's kind of a cool one. Also exorbitantly expensive, but a pretty, if you want to drink wasp butt extract while you're out exercising, that's a, it's, I mean, just to impress your friends at least, whip that out at the gym. Hold on. <laughs> that's the, uh, chia surge, that's, that's another chia base. And then wind force is really interesting. I, I contacted this company because almost all their ingredients are like oils that, that are traditional, traditionally vegetable oils that would have to be subjected to high amounts of heat and pressure in order to be isolated, but they have this really cool cold press method that they use to get the vegetable oils that they're using into their gel. So this is like, um, anybody ever heard of like Udo's oil? Udo's oil is really popular. It's like this mix of a bunch of plant-based oils that are cold processed, they're non-oxidized, they're non-heated, 
This is very similar to that, but in a gel-based format. It's called WindForce. It's made in Switzerland. Um, one of my friends who's a natural a medical doctor just won Ironman UK, and this is what she used the whole time on the bike, was just this fat-based WindForce energy gel. Um, and then uh, hammer gel peanut butter is one of the hammer gel flavors that is much, much lower. Still got peanuts in it, eh, but it's, uh, it's got less of, the, less of the sugars. And then a company called Yum Butter makes, again, superfood almond butter with chia seeds, hemp seeds, and goji berries. So lots of options out there that are not sugar-based. So know that there, that, and there's more and more companies like this that are popping up that have things that go above and beyond just carbs. So if I were gonna go out and do, a, do an Ironman, for example, in a couple weeks when I do an Ironman, I'll wake up. Normally, I would have had um, like a ton of probably sweet potatoes with honey, bottle of Gatorade, ton of carbs, you know, and, and pasta the night before. Now I get up in the morning, I make myself a cup of coffee, and I pour some MCT oil in there, I put some butter in there, I put some almond butter in there, I put some coconut milk in there, I blend that up, it's called Bulletproof Coffee, and I drink that, that's what I have for breakfast, all fats, no carbohydrates at all before I get out there, okay? And that's, that's compared to the 1,000 to 1,500 grams of carbohydrates I would have had, you know, three years ago before the race. During the bike ride of an Ironman, during the 112 mile bike ride, I'll use that MCT oil, amino acid, slow release starch that I talked about, or possibly this year I might use just bone broth, coconut water, and maybe some of those chia seeds with a little bit of, of raw honey. Okay, that would be rather than Gatorade, Powerade, stuff like that. At the end of every hour on the bike, just so I get some real food, I'll probably take either those bonk breakers or else the, the hammer bars, all real food, not like a power bar, not like a cliff bar, no immune issues there, and I'll eat one of those instead of eating one of the nasty Frankenfuel energy bars. Fat-based energy gels, so for the run, what I'll have is basically just like a little pack, and I'll carry the, the nut butter and the coconut oil or the cacao butter-based energy gels with me out on the run so I don't have to stop at the aid stations. Have you ever seen the aid station in an Ironman triathlon? It's, it's really interesting. So you're, you're running, and every mile you get to this table. It's like as long as this stage, and it's like cookies, uh, Coke, bananas, pretzels, tons of gels, more Coke, and just like people are just like shoving all this stuff in your face as you run by. And like literally, I would do Iron Man, and you just run by and you'd be like, grab, 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 just like, and you go running off, and I'd have like a Coke, a gel, mouthful of pretzels, and you just go running off to the next aid station. That would, that's just like how you do it. And you, you know, that's why you feel like crap and usually wind up in the porta potty at mile 13. <laughs> but um, instead, this works really, really well. You just do a little bit, of, little bit of nut butter and some of these natural fuels in your pocket and you just avoid the aid stations altogether. And then of course, an enormous giant extra large margarita afterwards. Because <laughs> I, yeah, I do let go sometimes and actually do things like that. Possibly even a Michelob. Um, <laughs> Or, or a Vermont microbrew, they have them in Hawaii. Okay, so to bring this full circle, again, what this all comes down to is it's not just about performance, because everything you read about in these nutrition magazines, like I mentioned, it works. It works. Like, all these carbs and sugars work to make you fast, but what we don't want is a bunch of connective tissue degradation. If you see, like, an aged athlete who's wrinkled on the outside, skin is just connective tissue. If someone's wrinkled and just worn on the outside, just think about what the connective tissue in the bones and the joints look like farther down, okay? That's not just sun damage. That's actual glycation damage. It's free radical damage. So you want to consider what it is that you're doing to your body when you exercise, the way that you fuel your body during exercise, and consider not just how fast your 5K is, but what's going on inside your body when you cross the finish line. You know, and, and I don't know about you, but I want to be the old man wearing MC Hammer pants with the two. So I got to work on the beard. I can't grow a beard to save my life. But I want to be that guy with the cool beard when I'm 70, 80 years old. Like that, you know, you, you definitely want your body to go and go and go and not just wear it out and then come to a screaming halt when you're 40, 50, 60 years old. So... That being said, I want to open it up to your guys' questions about pre-workout nutrition, post-workout nutrition, how to fuel your body, anything that I just talked about. Um, and like I mentioned, you can go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash shellburn for resources of any of the stuff that I talked about. I've got a website at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com where I get on the phone with people around the world and I just talk to them about fitness, nutrition, exercise, healthy living, longevity, stuff like that. And then I also have a book and we've got like 
I think we've got like 20 of them here. So, uh, and you can you can get a book if you really. It's only 450 pages long, so it's a good good little nighttime read for you, and um, it's chock full of even even more stuff uh, about nutrition and, and training and recovery.